Welcome to The Next Chapter, a show about how to move your life forward and what comes next. I'm your host, Carrie Pena, co-founder of the Center for Positive Media. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Pena, and this is The Next Chapter podcast. With me in studio today, Clayton Eckhart, who is a mental health advocate. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm excited today. We'll try to keep this one I mean, very impactful, but somewhat brief because I'll talk for hours. You No, but that's why we brought you in here because you have so much to say. So people might recognize you. You were on a national TV show, The Bachelor. And while that seems, you know, like, wow, he was on The Bachelor. There's a lot that has happened since then. And a lot of it has not been positive for you in your life. Yeah. Um, I get asked a lot if I would do it all over again. Um, and the answer always varied depending on what stage of my life you asked me that question, but as it stands today, I would do it a thousand times over because I just felt that that trauma, those traumatic experiences were vital for my growth and where I am today. What do you think was the lesson that you learned that was the most pronounced for you in going through that? You were famous and then you had sort of various falling out with different people. Mm -hmm. So what was the one thing that stands out to you as like, this is the lesson I learned from all of this? the importance of authenticity. Uh, I grew up a people pleaser and I was always trying to build an image of something that I thought other people would accept. Uh, and I found myself at the end of The Bachelor not being accepted by a lot of people. And I just, it has struck me in that moment that I am in this position, but I'm not even authentically me. I'm in this position as something that I built up that I don't even want to be. And, I'm, and that version of me is disliked. So the lesson that it taught me in that moment, I, I had this moment of realization of how about you build back up an image, but this time build it in the way that you want it to be. Be your authentic self. I mean, you feel like no one likes you at this point, so what do you have to lose? Mm -hmm. You can only go up. So how about you just be you and then see if if that version of you um, is, is a happier version. Were you depressed? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly, it was sad because, but very eye-opening. I did a breathwork session. Um, I got invited to one a couple months ago and I never done it, but I was like, sure, I was open to at least um, not being a critic until afterwards. So I was like, yeah, I'll be open to the idea. Uh, at one point in the breathwork session, uh, the instructor said, I want you to go back to the happiest moment of your life and just dwell in that moment. So I said, okay, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, it must be like a week ago, two weeks ago. But next thing I know, I'm thinking back a year, two years, five, 10 years. This is over the course of milliseconds, but I can't think of anything. And then all of a sudden, just boom, this image pops up in my head. And it was me probably at six years old on the playground with my two brothers. And I just burst out crying because I realized that that was the last moment where I was truly happy before I started to like be aware of others and pay, started paying attention to what was around me. And... I guess maybe that would have, I would have been a little bit older. I, I, I did, the starting point was seventh grade is mm -hmm. when I could really pinpoint where I started to be more like mindful of others and care about their opinions. So maybe a six, it says six years old, maybe I was in sixth grade yeah. in that image. I just remember playing on the playground with my brothers and being so happy and that moment was powerful because I'm like, I haven't been happy since that point in my life. So talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit about where you grew up. You grew up in a small town and you say that you were bullied mm -hmm. at, at some points growing up. Yeah. And then you ended up becoming an athlete and wanting to kind of be this strong, manly man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was bullied. I mean, I was a small kid. I, I In seventh grade, I was uh, five, six, maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet. Um, and so I, I also came from a, uh, a Lutheran school to a public school. Um, and I, you know, I was very religious and I was bullied for being this Christian kid that wanted to wait until marriage, that, you know, stayed away from girls. I was kind of just my own self, but I was, was bullied from, from these kids uh, that were in my grade. Well, then I just, the bullying kept happening and it just made me feel that I, I wasn't good enough. You know, I was getting picked on by these, these bullies. Meanwhile, uh, I started to, when hormones hit freshman year of high school, I wanted to start dating the women that, that, you know, were friends of mine, but they didn't want to date me. They all friends owned me. They called me big brother. Um, and then on top of that, I wasn't a good athlete. Um, so I was told that, you know, Hey, like you just, you should quit football. Your brother's better than you. Uh, and so relationships and sports were all I had back then as a kid. To, to define my value. So I went on this mission where I was like, I don't feel good enough. So in order for me to feel good enough, my juvenile mind thought, well, I have to improve upon my relationships and I have to prove upon sports. Um, 
couldn't figure out the relationships. So the sports thing made sense to me. How about I just get bigger, stronger, and faster? So I went on this mission. I just, I built up this image and I found success in it. Um, and then I started to, you know, get noticed by women for being this, you know, this large individual that was successful in sports. And I thought that I had figured it out at that point. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I see this is how I finally got to this place of value in the eyes of others. But then once I, you know, played my last football game, all that value went, vanished again. You talk now about the fact that you really bought into toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did that do to you? Yeah. So I grew up in a conservative part of the country where uh, it was, yeah, I, men, you know, basically don't cry. Uh, if, if you do, you're, you're, you're more womanly. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm using, I'm going to use the nicest terms possible. There's a lot of expletives I couldn't, you know, use that were said <laughs> growing up, but uh, basically, you know, real men don't cry. They don't show emotion. If they have a problem, they, they just hit somebody, you know, it was, just, it was about being violent, physical. Um, and so that's, it, that worked well with football. And that was the environment I was raised around, uh, with other, you know, classmates that was, it was all about like, okay, put your hand in the dirt and then hit someone hard if you got a problem or go, you know, to the gym and lift weights and, uh, or go hit a punching bag. You know, th these are the ways to release your emotions. Don't, don't release them through voicing them. We don't talk about that stuff. That's weak. So that was what I was raised around. And, and, and again, even like physical, physical appearance, you know, uh, I, I used a, a three in one. I, I, up until about a year and a half ago, I finally switched to like individual shampoo, conditioner, and body wash because I didn't want to like switch and do one, one of each because then it would have made it seem like I cared too much mm. about my appearance. <laughs> so like that's that's the level like how hardwired it was into me. Like I can't make it seem like I care mm. too much about my appearance because oh you got a, a certain hair product, you're gay, you're girly, whatever. That's what was said to me, and so I was so focused on trying to be accepted and not be seen as something that again, the juvenile, juvenile immature mind of mine was like, I don't want anyone to think anything of other than what I present. So let me just like protect all these things. What you're describing is someone who, you know, you really didn't know yourself. No. You, you just were struggling to try to create an image to make everyone else mm -hmm. happy. Yeah. And Down to the way I dressed. Um, I wouldn't, you know, certain clothes that I liked, but I, but no, no one else wore them. So I was like, well, if I wear them, this is what I actually want to wear, but I'm afraid that I'll show up to, you know, to school. And I would do this a couple of times. I get a little bold and I would get a new outfit and I would go into this and I, I'd walk into a school and I, the entire time I was stressed, I had high anxiety. Cause I was just like, I'm just waiting for that first person to be like, what is that? Mm. And then once that one person said it, boom, never wore it again. I mean, that's all it took. And then you ended up playing football. You you did get drafted, right, into the NFL? Free agent. Yeah, I wasn't drafted, but picked up after the fact. So you played several years in... Just two months. Oh, two months. I had a cup okay. of coffee. I played, I played for the Seahawks for two squad, months. I'm your by the way. I know, yeah. And I, <laughs> so I, I played five years at Mizzou, University of Missouri, and mm -hmm. then I just had a brief two-year or two, two months stint with the Seahawks. But you started getting like this taste of fame, right? Yeah. So, and then that must have done something for you with that lack of com inner confidence, but now you're getting more famous. Yeah. People are recognizing you. The girls are paying more attention to you. And so mm -hmm. how did that play into this equation? Oh, I mean, it was all the external validation I ever needed to make it to the highest level. That is the NFL. I mean, that was the pinnacle of when I went on this journey to try to impress people by building this physical image. Now, not only did I build the image, but I was able to put it to use at the highest possible level that such a small fraction of people ever make. So I, I'll never forget when I was signed on by the Seahawks, I had uh, the ability to go back home in my hometown. I put on all of my Seahawks gear. I put on the sweatpants, sweatshirt, uh, and I went to my high school unannounced. I just showed up because I wanted to walk through those halls and just be like, look who finally, who made it. Mm -hmm. look, everyone that, all of you that doubted me, look who made it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the teachers, all that thought I wasn't going to amount to anything. Like, look now, I don't have to say anything. So I was just, I did that to stroke my ego. And I had that and I was getting messages, hundreds of messages a day by people just wanting to talk to me because I was the shiny object. Um, but I was only there for, like I said, for two months. So the second those two months ended, I got cut. The very next day, my phone went from about 100 people texting me to two. I mean, it was like that drastic because all of a sudden no one cared anymore. It's like I might have just been in the NFL yesterday, but I just got cut. I'm no longer an NFL athlete. And all of a sudden I realized I was like, this external validation is fleeting. It's not what you're really searching to fill that void, which is internal validation. You know, I, I can relate with that because so many, I 
came up in the broadcast journalism world. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of folks who get really attached to being on TV, if you switch your career, you're no longer on TV, it's very competitive. And all of a sudden, then you're like, who am I? Because this is who I thought I was as a person. Mm -hmm. I think you're making such an important point there. And then how did The Bachelor come to be? Yeah, well, timing is everything. And I think some stuff is not left up to me. Um, I, I believe, you know, I'm spiritual. So I that's, that's I believe that things happen for a reason. It's the screen on my background on my phone says everything happens for a reason. And so uh, I actually was working a medical device sales job, which I took because again, I thought being an orthopedic medical device joint replacement sales rep- representative, that was a mouthful. And it sounded like very impressive and I was working the OR. And so I took that job for that reason mainly um, and because I could make good money, but that wore off. And I got to a point where I started not having the satisfaction that I once had. Um, I had a rift with my coworker at the time. And so I was like, you know what? I need to move. I need to get out of here. This is not the area for me. I cannot live and die uh, in Columbia, Missouri. I, I thought I need, there was something greater out there for me. So I was looking for jobs. Um, and just while I was looking for jobs, I had uh, a recruiter you know, slide in the DMs on Instagram <laughs> and said, uh, hey, uh, I work for, um, you know, NZK Productions that we we create The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, that show, would you be interested in coming on the show? And because I was already just looking for a new, you know, path, I was like, you know what? I mean, this is weird timing, but sure, I'll entertain it. And I kind of thought it would fall off naturally, but they just kept interviewing me and next step, next step, next step. And then all of a sudden it was there. They were like, come on the show. Like you have a ticket to, to make it on. And I thought, why not? I'll go on there. Um, and if I hate it, I can just leave, but I'll just, I'm bored right now. Anyways, I might as well just try it out, see what happens. And then you became nationally famous, known, and there was a hot debate about what kind of person you are. I mean, what does that feel like to know yeah. that, you know, millions of people are trying to figure out like what kind of guy you are? Yeah, I still see it all the time. Um, I every day there's there's some new comment online about me and the why I, you know I've been subjected to what I've been subjected to, uh, and sure, like I've played my part in it all. But it, I went on a reality TV show not knowing who I was, and then you know the hard part was my reality was not what I experienced; it was what was shown. So then I had to basically answer to a an edit or a an image of me that I didn't feel truly was me, uh, but again, I, I had to live with that because that is reality television. They can't show everything that happens. Uh, so they only have so much, you know, time to, for an episode, but that was hard. Um, because I felt that I tried to explain myself coming off the show, but no matter how much I tried to explain myself, I could only say so much. There was a lot of things I could not mention because they weren't shown. Therefore they didn't happen. So that was hard for someone that doesn't know themselves to just basically have to be like, I am what you saw, not really what actually happened. What is your next chapter? Honing in and locking in on on just a few things because I was a yes man being a people pleaser. I was saying yes to everything and that was draining me. So now the next chapter of my life, I'm locking in residential real estate. I do solar sales um, and then being a mental health advocate. I, when I can, I go speak around the country and talk to uh, people just about destigmatizing the conversations around mental health through my vulnerability that is sharing my story. What do you want people to learn from your story? That being authentic is always the best route to take. I think a lot of people, especially with social media, there's comparison culture. And a lot of people are living their lives based off of what they think others want for them. Um, and my, my story is, is really meant to show people that once you decide to finally go down the path that you want to go down, that's where your happiness lies. What do you think was a significant step forward for you in improving your own mental health? Uh, having my ego flatlined. Uh, that was <laughs> by far the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I, I, and when I was in Missouri, I didn't really have my ego challenged. It was a kind of an, I, what I would now describe as a slower paced, easier environment, environment to navigate. Um, and so my ego could kind of get away with some stuff, but once I went on reality television, every, all my insecurities got exposed, my weaknesses exposed out there for everyone to see. Um, and because there was just a magnifying glass on me. Uh, and so I went to, I had to try to explain everything at first. I tried to defend all my actions. and people wouldn't accept that. Because you're accused of being a womanizer and yeah. Everything under the sun. And so my ego naturally went into defense mode, um, but then no one was taking into, like nobody was hearing what I was saying. But then I found one day, there's this quote online 
or someone made a comment online. I read it and it changed my whole outlook. It was one comment and it really shows the power of one conversation, one, one message from a random stranger. They just put it out there in the universe, but they said, um, I, I understand where Clayton's coming from. I, I, but what I, what bothers me is he's, he's taking so much time explaining things as opposed to taking accountability. That was like the most powerful message. I, I wish I could remember who, who said that because I had sent him a message at this point, but I, I, I read that online and it just hit me. I'm like, this is your problem. Your ego is so focused on defending yourself as opposed to taking accountability. It's not about right or wrong. It's about understanding. It's about just being able to say, okay, own up to it and say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. Matt, I'm sorry that you got hurt by, by this. I'm sorry you took it this way. There's a big difference. There's a massive difference, yeah. right? The, you know, oh, I'm sorry you took it that way. That's not how I meant it. That's not taking any accountability. When you say, I'm sorry, I hurt you. And that's what I realized I did on the show. I hurt women and I was so focus at first saying, well, I didn't mean to hurt them. You know, that's just the way they took it. There's no accountability there. Mm. So the, the, the show forced me to be. Ego can be an ugly thing if we Very. don't keep it in check. Mm -hmm. So what is your life like today? Are you, are you happy? Yeah, I'm content. Uh, I think I still have a ways to go in my uh, self-growth journey. I'm still finding myself. I'm still figuring out what it is I want to do. Uh, and there's a lot of variables in my life. There's just a lot of craziness circulating around me. Um, so I'm trying to build some sense of uh, structure. Um, but overall, I mean, I do see the light. I'm walking towards that light at the end of the tunnel where I feel like I'm coming out of the darkness now. I finally ha can see where I'm headed and I have a clear path ahead. So yeah, I would say that's exciting considering, you know, about a year ago, I was in, in not even a year, year ago. I mean, really up until three months ago, I was still lost, still confused, still mm. trying to, still struggling every day, but presenting this image of, of peace and calm and, oh, I've, I'm, I got it all figured out. So this is, this is very fresh, yeah. this next chapter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we, as we wrap up, because it's, I think what so many, much of your story is powerful and it can help people. So I commend you for speaking out, making a decision to do that. I think one thing that is important is to talk about in your healing, you've, you've decided to really set boundaries for yourself. Mm -hmm. Could you just share a few of those? So the audience, you try to create more peace in your life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, um, things move very quickly now and I have to check in with myself to understand where my mental state is at. So throughout the day, I do these mental health checks where I'll just sit there for a brief moment, whether it's in my car, right before I even walked in here, I sat in my car and I just took a moment to say, you know, how, how are you feeling right now? Where's your, where's your energy at? Are you out of whack? Do you need to take a couple of breaths to, to calm yourself down? Um, you know, how are you feeling? And, and I do that Every morning, first time, when I, the second the alarm goes off, I, I sit up in my bed, I hang my feet off the edge of the bed. I sit there, I'm like, how, did, how do you feel mentally? How do you feel physically? Are you excited about today? Are you nervous about something? If so, what is it? Uh, I think this is important as, as far as mindfulness goes, many people aren't. Uh, and, and there's a reason for everything. There's a reason why people feel the way they do, why they're stressed, but most people just don't take the time to actually uh, go deep and, and start to pick it apart and say, why actually am I stressed today? It could be something as simple as uh, you ate, you know, fried food last night and it's just not jiving well with your stomach. And now you got a stomach ache and that stomach ache is causing stress in your body, which is translating to like anxiety. I mean, there's this connection, but people sometimes think like they don't take that time to realize it might just be the food you ate, you know, or it could be something much deeper. So for me, it's just about um, checking in with myself. Uh, and then with my life moving so quickly, the other thing that I do is um, I, I set times where I answer text messages. Um, I get too much stuff coming in at one time. So I just, I'm like, you know what? I will answer something at the beginning, at the end of the day. And then all throughout the, the day, I'll be present and all this other stuff. I'm just going to push by the wayside. If it's important, call me. If it's not, then I'll let it sit. And that's just the way that I protect myself from having to like constantly, I don't want to be on my phone all the time because that, that phone is dangerous. The phone is dangerous. Yeah. And just as, as we wrap, um, and I know my producer's looking at me like, you're over time. I know that, but I'm, I'm just I knew this was going to happen. This um, always happens with me. You're, you got your ears pierced. I understand that yeah. that had some kind of special significance for you. Yeah. Why? Yeah, because again, the toxic masculine environment I grew up in, um, you know, earrings, that if you were to put, put earrings in, a lot of people around me said, well, that makes you gay. I now obviously don't care about what people think about my sexuality. I'm like, I know what it is and it doesn't matter to me what you all think it is. But when I went to get it done, I sat up in the mirror and it just was that moment where I had this kind of identity crisis. I stared in the mirror and I thought, oh my gosh, this, this, I'm, people are going to think this, they're going to think this, but this, this, and this. And I had this, all these thoughts from the past flood in. 
And I got in my car and I looked in the, I was looking in the, the, the mirror and I'm like, oh man, I don't know. There's all these negative comments. But then I just stopped myself. I said, remember, like you came here for a reason. You got your earrings for a reason because you actually think they look pretty cool. You like them. You want, you saw the people that had them. You're like, I like those. I, I think they look good for me. And that's all it was. You don't have to think about all the other stuff. Again, what's, what, check in with yourself. Like, why did you do it for you? So stop thinking about what other people think. And now, I mean, it's like, I love it. I mean, it just fits me. And I get up in the morning. I don't know. It's just something that just kind of like gives me a little differentiator. It just makes me, me, I don't know. And whatever it says to people, I will say I connect with other people that have earrings. I mean, I just, I do. <laughs> I, I, I talk to guys now. It's like guys that have earrings. They come up, they talk to me, we chat it up. And I, I don't know. There's just some type of synergy there where it's like, you know, without even mm -hmm. having to say it, we obviously are on some type of parallel because you've got earrings, I got earrings. So I don't know. What, you what, freed yourself yeah. from so much and you're yeah. still working on that. And do you think you treat other people better now in this journey? Absolutely. Yeah. Because I treat myself better. So I think, you know, respect uh, what you give is, is uh, to others is what you give to yourself. And if you don't have any respect for yourself, then you won't respect others. So I've definitely been able to be more empathetic, uh, be more underst understanding, take time to really get to know people uh, because I've seen what happens when people don't take the time. And that's a lot of the people online did that to me and, I, and it hurt me. And so I, I just, that reminded me, don't be that person, be the person that takes the time to get to know others and give them the respect and you'll get it back. Clayton, thank you so much for coming in and sharing this part of your journey. And I wish you the best of luck. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, I keep it easy for myself mainly, uh, but it's all streamlined. You can go to if Clayton uh, Eckerd.com. It's my first and last name. Or if you have Instagram, you just go to Clayton Eckerd. And then I have a link in the bio that takes you to Clayton Eckerd.com. Um, it's just everything's Clayton Eckerd. All my socials, Clayton Eckerd. There might be a period within like one of them. <laughs> but just if you can figure out my name, then you'll find me. People want to find you, seem to be able to find you. Yeah, so, that's right. Clayton, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. This is the next chapter. I'm Carrie Pena. Thank you.